Um, Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha. I'm Aparajita. Um, and thank you for having us here. Um, I've actually been, the, the conviction that art is more real than real life itself has been growing within me um, for the past few months. So what you were talking in response to the first question really resonated. Um, what I'm thinking about is just as artists practice their art so as to create it better, uh, to create the sense that the representation of reality is more real than reality itself, mm. is akin to how the yogi or the, the one who's meditating practices their meditation, focusing upon something that seems not real, but is like latching on to, for, exa for example, with Japa, you dwell in the name of the God, which is like dwelling in a poem, for instance. Um, in chapter six, Arjuna t asks Krishna about the chanchala of the mind, and Krishna's response is abhyasena. Um, what is the nature of this abhyasa? Um, even in chapter 12, when uh, Krishna says it's much harder for those contemplating upon nirguna brahman versus saguna brahman, so you start with like mayeva mana adatsva, Mm. And then if you can't do that, then do abhyasa. And then if you can't do that, do sadma, sadva karma palatyaga. Mm. But isn't it also the case that in order to be able to do sadva karma palatyaga, that itself requires abhyasa? Mm. So what is the abhyasa that one needs to go about? Also in response to Arjuna in chapter 6, Krishna, after abhyasena, he also says uh, vaira, vairagyena. Mm. And I'm thinking of the qualities of a student. You have Viveka, Vairagya, the six categories, and Mumukshu. And this this is related to what you were saying about desirelessness, because isn't Mumukshu itself a desire for liberation? Okay, okay. there are multiple questions. Oh. We'll, we'll take. <laughs> yeah. So Aparajit has some really good questions. Let me start with where she started with art. Are you an artist? Yeah. Okay, what do you do, paint? I, I dance. You dance? Bharatanatyam. Bharatanatyam, very good. Um, so art. Before we go on, list a word about art. There are two sides to this. One is, from a spiritual perspective, not particularly helpful. Another is, it could be very helpful. So the best kind of art is that which has a link to the transcendent, to the spirit. There is some element that, that comes into this art, whatever it is, dance, painting, um, writing, where there's... Uh, a glimpse into something beyond, uh, standing on that wall and looking beyond to the other side. And then you bring it back because you can't show them what you saw on the other side. You try to express it through your language, through your dance, through your painting. So that art, that painting, that language, that dance has an element of the transcendent, of the infinite in the world of the finite. So art can do that. And Vivekananda, he told Sister Nivedita, Sister Nivedita writes, that our master told us religion, art and science are three ways in which you can reach the infinite. There are three ways of doing the same thing except that you need um, uh, Advaita to understand this. If it's a dualistic religion, it, will, it can use art to serve its purposes. But it will not say that art itself will take you to enlightenment. Advaita can say that art itself will take you to enlightenment. But it must, have, it must be that kind of art with that intention that I am reaching for the infinite. I am trying to express the infinite. I am trying to embody the infinite. Like Schopenhauer said, do your words come from more words or do your words come from silence? The words coming from silence are the real art, which is somewhere there is a touch of the infinite there. So that's the best kind. The other kind is not helpful. What kind? Um, that was the movement in the 20th century. Uh, the death of God, a Nietzschean death of God. Mm -hmm. There is no God, no religion, no spirituality, that's gone. Although I don't think Nietzsche meant it in that crude sense. But anyway, that's how it was taken. Now how do we replace that? Uh, we replace it with art, with society, uh, with mm -hmm. politics, with activism, with, um, uh, you know, there, there was this huge effort in the 20th century to find some replacement for God. Didn't work. The conclusion 100 years later is didn't work. There is nothing that will fill up the God-shaped hole in the human psyche. 
except God. The only shape that can fill up that God-shaped hole is the shape of God. <laughs> and I can't resist that joke about the Buddhist who um, filled up the God-shaped hole with a hole-shaped God. <laughs> hole, the zero, the empty, the void. <laughs> Now, the question was one of two questions, Abhyasa and Vairagya. What is the nature of this Abhyasa? Um, in art and in spirituality, we require the mind and our faculties, our sense organs and all of that. But these are very much part of this world. The mind and all, they, are, they partake of the material world. Whatever partakes of the material world must follow material rules, the rules of this, this universe. So cause and effect. You must generate a powerful enough cause which will give a powerful enough effect. You know, the psychologist, um, Height, Jonathan Height, in that book, Happiness Hypothesis, he says, why is it that uh, all these wonderful ideas about self-help and self-improvement don't really work? You know, Barnes and Noble, you'll find the biggest row of shelves and shelves of books are on self-help. Anything, you know, like if you just see one rack of such books, it's enough to make your life, you might become this super person. But it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Why not? The reason he says is that, that, uh, it's the intellect which consumes these books. It's the heart which feels inspired by these books. Uh, the benefits of getting up early in the morning and doing yoga, the benefits of reading a lot, the benefits of um, you know, being altruistic, benefits of focus, uh, so many things. And the wonderful, if you read all that, the great ideas are great, and you feel, oh, I really want to be like that. And this is a great idea, great techniques. What's the problem? The problem is when you have to do it, it's not the intellect which has to do it. When you get up early in the morning and do yoga, it's the body which has to do it. And when you get up in the early in the morning, it's tomorrow in the morning, I'm going to get up and do yoga at 4 a.m. in the morning or 5 a.m. It's cold and you are tired and sleepy and it's time to do yoga. The body says, nope. <laughs> Did you ask me? <laughs> yeah. you, you go and do yoga, intellect. <laughs> You can do it in your dreams. I'm sleeping here under the cover. <laughs> now, uh, Jonathan Hyde points out that the body and the other elements of our being, like emotions, uh, like uh, uh, you know, the lower mind, uh, they do not respond to ideas. Unfortunately, they don't respond to ideas. Even the mind does not respond to ideas. For example, focus is great. I'm convinced. But the mind is not focused. Why not? I'm convinced. The mind which is convinced. No, the intellect is convinced. That's one part of the mind. The other part of the mind is habitual. And that's a great key to how these things work. How does the mind work? How, does the, how do emotions work? How does the body work? They operate on habit. Why do they operate on habit? Habit is inertia. Habit is generated by causes. And it's the effect of several causes in the past. And that's how the universe works. Body, mind are part of the universe. So too is intellect, but intellect is a little sattvic, higher. Um, so how do, we, how do we get the body and the mind and the emotions to cooperate in our big projects? Training. The word for training in Sanskrit is abhyasa. It is, Jonathan Haidt says, the mahut and the elephant. The mahut knows where to go. He's got the GPS and the um, Google Maps. The elephant doesn't know where to go. The elephant, you have to guide the elephant to that place where you want to go. But the elephant is much stronger than the mahut. If the elephant doesn't want to go, there's nothing that the mahut can do to drag the elephant there. Then how will the elephant listen to the mahut? The elephant responds to training. The elephant has been trained. The elephant of the body, the elephant of our emotions and our lower mind, they respond to abhyasa, that which is really difficult for us. Put in the requisite abhyasa, it will become really easy for us. It's really easy for us to remain cozy in bed and nap early in the morning. And I've seen so many monks for whom it's impossible to do that. 
I have seen a monk at the point of death in the hospital. Old Swami, point of death. He sits up in his hospital bed and faces the wall. I've seen this literally. Faces the wall and sits rock steady in meditation for two hours. And he thinks we marvel. How is that possible? The thing is, it's abhyasa. He cannot not do it. He's been doing it for 60 years, 70 years. That's the power of abhyasa. Yeah. You use this secret that body responds to habit, emotions respond to habit, the mind responds to habit, and train. That just takes a lot of meticulous work for, and it has to be done systematically. The, the essence of practice, the essence of abhyasa is repetition. Do it again and again so that the cause becomes strong enough. The effect will follow. You put a groove. Replace other grooves with a new groove which you put into the mind. Then vairagya. Vairagya is very important because what really ties us to this world. Advaita Vedanta will say ignorance. You do not know, the, you know your real nature as pure consciousness. That's what ties you to the world. Theory, theory, practically... The nasty part of all of this is what ties us to the world is desire. What is desire? Vivekananda says, Thine only is the hand that holds the rope that drags thee on. You are holding on to the world. You are holding on to the body. You are holding on to this limited uh, existence. That's why when we are told about your unlimited awareness, either we don't want to listen to it, people find it upsetting, when we are told the world is an appearance, an illusion, a dream, so many people become upset. They don't want it. I want to be spiritual, but I want this world to be real too. They don't want it. I can understand why, why people in the world might be upset um, when you say the world is false, it's an appearance. And, but why would a genuine spiritual seeker be uh, upset? Good riddance. Good, for, <laughs> good news, the world is an appearance. What's the big deal? It's desire. I'm holding on. So vairagya is dispassion. Let go, let go. There is nothing here worth holding on. You are hurting yourself. You are being dragged along by a phantom. Oh, a very, very, very ancient verse. Beautiful verse. You know what it says? It says, You are immersed in the ocean of bliss. Alas, you do not see. What do you see? You see the water of a mirage and chase, it, chase after it lifetime after lifetime. What is this mirage? The world, samsara. It's like the, the, the water of immortality. You are immersed in it. You don't see it. What do you see? You see samsara, which is the water of a mirage. Not there. What's a mirage? It's not there. There's no water there. You see water of the mirage and it, I'm trying to quench my thirst through, and chasing that. Obviously I'll never get it because it's not there. And then what do I do? I try and try and try till the body is old and decrepit and it cannot do anything more and it uh, breaks down and it dies. I go out into the world, into the other worlds with this powerful desire, that, that hunger and thirst for that mirage water and I embody myself again and again and again. This is samsara. That's why vairagya is the, is the antidote. Vivekananda says, the color of the monk's robe is the color of freedom. Let go of the rags of worldliness which you are wearing. So this is, you don't have to put on this color. The thing is, color the mind with this color, the color of freedom. Whether externally you become a monk, or but internally one must. The one who has become a monk must first become internally a monk. And all of us who are spiritual seekers must internally become this monk like this is called vairagya let go of small things if you want the infinite you will dwell within it so literally what does it mean to let go do I throw everyone out of the house and toss my furniture and my belongings out onto the curb no everything will remain everything will remain as such but you are no longer looking to it at all for fulfillment you will do your duty where you are. You will do your best for everyone around you, in your family, in your community, in your office, wherever you are. That also becomes a spiritual practice for you. 
So you don't look to them or those things or those activities for as the goal of your life that this is going to fulfill me. No. Spiritual realization, enlightenment, God realization becomes the goal of our lives. That's real spirituality. What's not real spirituality is using spirituality to enhance our worldliness. For in ancient times, religion is of these two kinds. And it's good, both of them are there. In the ancient Karmakanda, there was uh, the vast ritualistic panoply, the, the par paraphernalia of uh, the Vedic rituals which the ancient Vedic Hindus used to perform. For what? Not for very noble um, goals. Let there be adequate rainfall, let the crops be bountiful, uh, let the children be safe from disease, um, let my enemies perish. <laughs> And after all of this, a full, wonderful life in this world, let me go to heaven and have more of this. <laughs> this was the idea that God will help me to. In, that, in those days, it was the ritual itself, not even appealing to God. And then there was the spirituality of the Upanishads, which we are talking about here. Advaita Vedanta and all based on the Upanishads. Where, no, 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 I'm not looking to this limited world. I'm seeking to transcend it and realize who I am, this infinite being, and therefore I go beyond all want. There are two kinds. Spirituality for improving my, my life in the world and spirituality and my life for attaining spiritual realization. The reverse. And the same is true now. People don't really, not many people perform those elaborate Vedic rituals. They are sort of outmoded. But here in the United States, especially on the other coast. We have this entire very popular spirituality and I'll make myself unpopular by saying these things. You know, whether it is foretelling the future and uh, you know, um, jewels and crystals to set right my karma uh, or uh, knowing the minds of other people or the ability to control the thoughts and attract other people uh, or to win the lottery. Notice all of those are trying to use otherworldly, so-called otherworldly means to achieve very this-worldly results. These this-worldly results will come anyway, but they are not to our liking, because I haven't done enough good karma to deserve all these things. I want want more, so I want some kind of spiritual ways of attaining something. Let me fix the game the, of karma so that it works in my favor. Now the old Vedic religion the rituals, I dare say it had the advantage of actually working. To some extent, it, at least to some extent. There's no, ultimately it will, it will disappoint you because it's all limited. Whether this world or the next world, everything comes to an end and leaves you with a bitter taste. And with unhappiness. But the new age spirituality, some of it, I'm not condemning it at all, but some of it, it's just plain hoax. It's just plain hoax. Playing upon the gullible, playing upon the weak, playing upon the suffering, giving them hope, and then making dollars out of it, money out of it. Be strong. You don't need any of it. You are the infinite. Why do you need these little things? Why do you need these little magic tricks? Why do you need these little ghosts and spirits? No. You are their master. They belong to you. And the genuine spirituality is still there, which is my life for spiritual realization. Not those spiritual stuff for improving this particular little life. So always throughout human history, it's been like this. Now why did I say it was good? Well, even if you are going to God for this worldly gain, you at least have a faith in God. That much, that much uh, goodness is there. That those who go to a temple or a church or something and try to um, pray for you know, curing a disease or get, winning the lottery or whatever, is uh, they have uh, faith in God. They're helping. They're asking for the help of God. To that extent, it's good, but still, it's worldliness. All right. Thank you. So, vairagya is absolutely necessary. Thank, Thank you. you.